All right, so today I'm here to present Orboot. Um, I'm Ryan O'Leary. Orboot's a project worked on by uh, quite a few people. Um, Ron is a big contributor. Um, there's some contributors in the crowd today. I see Christian Svensson's here. Um, uh, so who here is familiar with Quaboot? A lot of people. Um, so Orboot is basically a fork of Quaboot um, without C code. It's all written in Rust. Um, that, that's the main, uh, um, the main thing behind it. Um, so in this talk, I'll talk about what Orboot is, um, some of the firmware challenges we ran into, some of the cha challenges we ran into with Rust, um, what targets it supports, so there's a few RISC-V targets it supports, um, and some design decisions uh, that has gone on in making it. Um, so what is Orboot? Um, so, sorry if I'm missing someone's favorite project here. This is a list of some other open source uh, firmware projects, um, like U-Boot, Linux Boot, Core Boot, Nerf. Um, the big thing behind all these projects, all the existing projects today, is all written basically in C. Um, most of these use C code um, somewhere in the project, um, and that's kind of a um, across all firmware projects. That's kind of a big common pattern you'd see. Um, and C is kind of an old language, probably like forty or fifty years old. And what we really wanted to do is use a modern, more safe uh, sort of language. Um, there's also another. There's other things we're trying to fix in Orboot. Um, so, for example. Um, we want to jump to the kernel as quickly as possible. Um, we want to push as much work into the kernel as possible. And we kind of want to use the Linux boot model. Um, we don't want to implement lots of device drivers in the firmware. Uh, Linux has uh, great drivers already, very secure drivers, very fast. Um, we, want, uh, we want a stricter policy on what is accepted as open uh, source code. Um, we made uh, Warboot supports a few targets, including uh, RISC-V, it also supports x86 and ARM, but we really want to limit it, limit it to platforms which are fully open source. Um, we want to, um, yeah, the, another big, okay, so I'll go over what the, the a very simple, simplistic view of what firmware should be doing. So when you power on the system, all it has to do is get the system ready to run your software. We kind of want to cut out from the, from the firmware everything else. Like we don't want a whole network stack. We don't want a whole USB stack. We want it ready immediately to run your software. Um, one of the big goals behind that is a, a one second boot. We want to be able to boot a platform like a BMC or a, a laptop in one second. Um, and we really believe if the um, advances in REST and um, other, other things we could use, we could achieve this goal. Um, possibly using coroutines or parallelism. Um, REST provides lots of safety in that regard, which isn't seen in many other pieces of firmware. So I'll go over the boot flow um, of, of Orboot. This is very similar to how core boot works, um, but there's a few modifications. Um, so at the beginning, we have the boot blob. This is where the first instruction resides. Uh, it excludes directly out of flash. Um, initializes the CPU um, and the, the, the basic hardware, and it prints um, a single debug message, uh, welcome to Orboot. Um, then it sets up the, the static RAM, like the caches RAM, um, and then it jumps to the, the ROM stage. Um, the beginning of the ROM stage is still executed directly from Flash um, and has very little memory to work with, uh, pro probably about 30 kilobytes on some embedded platforms. Um, and the only purpose of this stage is to initialize the RAM. Once the RAM is initialized, it's ready to jump to an operating system. So the next stage is a payloader stage. So this doesn't dilly with um, network stacks and disk drivers. It jumps directly to the operating system. Um, and the operating system might be one such as Linux boot, which does have the network stack, does have the disk drivers, and that jumps to whatever your software would be. Um, skip this piece of time. Um, so how many of you are familiar with Rust? So, oh, quite a few people. Um, so for Orboot, we came up with this driver model. Um, so each driver has um, four basic functions, initialization, shutdown, as well as a, a, a read and write. So pread is positional read, so read as specific position. Um, so let's you implement stuff like block devices. Um, 
So here's an example of how would you, you would use the PV function. Um, just say you had a, a block device which is 100 bytes. You have your 32-byte buffer. You keep calling the PV function. Um, on this buffer, it reads 32 bytes every time, and eventually it gets to the end. And you pass in the cursor every time you read from it. Um, the reason we do this instead of a read function is because pread is immutable. You pass in the cursor every time, um, which from a Rust perspective, uh, it, it's, a lot, it's a lot nicer to work with um, because in Rust you could have multiple immutable references to the same object. Um, so these are a few examples of the driver we've, drivers we've implemented in Orboot. Um, so we have a memory driver which reads directly from memory. Um, we have some serial drivers. Uh, we have a spy driver. Um, we also have what we call virtual drivers. Uh, so these kind of work on, they don't work with physical hardware, but they work with, it's a nice abstractation. So for example, just say you have a console in your firmware where you write, write output to, and you want that outputted, output written to multiple devices. Um, for example, if you have multiple UATs, um, you could use the console driver, and you give it a list of, uh, a list of drivers and it kind of replicates the output to each one. Um, so this is kind of a nice interface, and Rust makes it safe to implement. Um, if you compare this to C, where they don't really have language support for interfaces, it's a, it's a it's very nice breath, uh, breath of fresh air. Um, and in Rust, you also get printf for free. So printf is part of the, the core language in Rust. Um, they have a printf implementation, which you could rate the output to whatever you are to a device you want. Um, so for Orboot, we didn't use CBFS. Um, we didn't use the core boot file system. Instead, we came up with a new system called the DTFS. Um, this is basically a file system implemented using device tree. Um, the main reason behind this is we just have one, we already had to write a parser for device tree, so we might as well just reuse it for the, the file system as well in the firmware. Um, you can see an example of one that we put in a 60 megabyte pod. So we have the boot blob at the beginning, um, and then we have different payloads, etc. Um, and then the other nice thing about a device tree is f with Linux, you just pass in the device tree to Linux, and it's exposed under the sys file system, sys slash device tree, um, and you can see all the payloads uh, and items under there. And here's an example for the, the Sci 5 board. Uh, this is the, the DTFS that we use for that. And you can see there's multiple, I think there's yeah, three payloads here. Um, so this is kind of how we organize the, the source code for the firmware. We have, it's, it's very similar to Coreboot. We have a directory, directories for the main boards, slash the vendor, slash the, the, specif the specific main board. We have uh, packages for the CPU, for the SOC, for the drivers, um, as well as the payloads. Um, details with the build system. One interesting um, feature we're using from Rust is we could, it makes it easy to just allocate everything on the stack, um, which is very useful during early uh, firmware. Um, everything's allocated on the stack, and you could tell at compile time how much stack you use. There's a tool which tells you. Um, so you could formally prove how much memory your program is going to use and whether it's going to fit in a very small SRAM or, or car on the system. Um, Another thing we're trying to work out is coroutines. Um, this is for the, the one second boot I mentioned earlier. Um, Rust has language safety features uh, f uh, which would greatly help in doing this to make it safe to implement coroutines. Um, this is still a work in progress and if, if everyone, anyone wants to help out with this, um, we'd <laughs> greatly appreciate the help. Um, so the first talk we did was ARM, but you're probably not too interested in this. Uh, we did ARM, ARM QMU, ARM on hardware, um, and then we switched to the Hi5 Unleashed board. Uh, so it has, a, it has five cores, oh, sorry, five hearts. Um, it has the um, heart zero, which has everything but a floating point unit, and then four other hearts, which are capable of running Linux. Um, at first, we, uh, we wanted to run it in, we preferred to run Linux in M mode. Um, the idea being, Linux would run in M mode, uh, the user mode would be a new mode, Linux would run without an MMU, so we needed some patches from Christoph Helbig. Um, and 
Uh, we found some challenges with this. Uh, then we switched to using Orboot to, uh, with OpenSBI as a payload, um, and that put Linux for us, um, which works a lot better. Um, but we're still trying to run Linux in M mode. Uh, the, the main reason is we wanted Linux to be the only thing running the system, like the lowest layer, um, as well as there's some performance improvements to not having to context switch to M mode. Um, so I could show you the, the demo of... Yeah. Um, so to run it, you just type cargo make. So if you're in the directory for this mainboard, type cargo make uh, run, and it runs in QMU. Um, and you can see here it booted into Linux. Um, Linux running in M mode, and then it crashed because there's no, there's no init RAMFS. Um, so the next thing um, that we're working on right now is uh, the next target is Open Titan Earl Grey. Uh, so there's currently no ASIC you can purchase to test this on. Um, so all your work has to be done on a in or on a FPGA. Um, it is a it's a more embedded system, so this can't run Linux. So we can't do something like Linux boot. So we'll have to end up implementing more of these drivers inside Orboot. Um, at this point, uh, it's still a work in progress. We've, we've gotten some simple Hello Worlds um, and jumping to some simple payloads, but our main goal is to boot uh, the TAR kernel, um, which is a kernel also written in Rust um, and targeted for embedded systems. Uh, so this is how you can get involved. Um, so we have a, a Slack. Um, you can join that link. Um, we have the GitHub. You can check it out. We have some documentation on how you can build and run it on various targets. Um, here's some items you could help us with. We have GitHub issues for these. And um, if you want to work on it, just ask on Slack, and we can get you started. Ole, any questions? Uh, yes, yes. So we'll need some drivers for, um, yeah, for like the AES hardware um, to implement Secure Boot. Um, that's one of the the projects we're kind of uh, that we need help with. Um, some verified boot system. Um, mainly right now we're just trying to get the the operating system to boot the the talk kernel. Um, but once we get that part, it shouldn't be too difficult to to work up the details of a Secure Boot system. Oh, repeat the questions. OK. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, how about the SBI? Did you use OpenSBI So the question is, does Orboot serve SBI calls, or do we use OpenSBI? So when we use OpenSBI as the payload, OpenSBI serves those calls. Um, we don't have any code in Orboot to serve OpenSBI calls. Um, when you run Linux as, in M mode, um, it doesn't require that. Um, so if you wanted open SBI calls, you would just use open SBI as a payload. In, in library mode, you use it as a library or you use it as a payload? Uh, just as a payload. So it's a, it's a binary blob. So you just jump to yeah, it? Yeah, we just jump to it. All right. Any other questions? Oh, here we go. Oh, okay, so that's where things have changed. I have a backup slide for this here. So this is our <laughs> x86 policy. Um, it's it's uh, we we put some thought into exactly what the policy should be. The problem is for x86 platforms nowadays, you need some sort of closed source blobs. Um, we're working on like sort of a measure to measure it, um, like what percent of the what percent of the the firmware is closed source, how much of it is open source. Um, but you could find this policy on the GitHub. Um, I think uh, Ron is sort of starting work on this. Um, yeah, but the difficulty is you can't make a fully open source x86 system at this point. 
Thank you.